collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. The second biggest bank collapse in U.S. history. The collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is causing shockwaves across the entire business world. With the FDIC now in control. The American banking industry was once an emblem of strength and stability, but lately it's been taking a beating. One of the biggest blows came when Silicon Valley Bank, a lender that used to fund promising tech startups, spectacularly went belly up. Just days after revealing massive losses, the bank went down in flames on March 10th, leaving everyone wondering what went wrong. Join us in this video as we uncover the reasons behind Silicon Valley Bank's epic failure, point fingers at the culprits, and dissect the bad decisions that led to its downfall. Brace yourself for a tale that shook the very foundations of banking. Silicon Valley Bank has been a major force in financing tech startups during the tech industry's booming growth. However, their penchant for taking risk has proven to be their undoing, as it led to the largest bank failure in the U.S. since the Great Recession of 2008. This collapse has raised concerns that it could have a similar impact on the world's economy as the Washington Mutual Bank's collapse did in 2008. As the world's largest economy, a recession in the U.S. could have far-reaching consequences on political stability, emerging markets, and globalization efforts. To understand what went wrong, we need to grasp how banks function. Banks are financial institutions that offer services such as lending, borrowing, and depositing money. They generate profits by charging higher interest rates on loans than on deposits. But when banks invest in risky ventures, such as lending to borrowers who are unlikely to repay their loans, they may face default leading to their downfall. Furthermore, if a bank's assets lose value, it may become insolvent, prompting depositors to rush to withdraw their funds. In summary, banks collapse when they take on too much risk and their assets lose value, creating a lack of trust among depositors. Let's understand it with a little metaphor. Imagine a surfer riding the waves of the ocean. The surfer is Silicon Valley Bank, and the waves represent the booming high-tech industry. For years, the bank rode these waves, taking risks and financing tech startups, growing its reputation as a key player in the industry. However, as the waves grew bigger and more treacherous, the bank's appetite for risk-taking became too great. It took on more than it could handle, ultimately wiping out in a catastrophic fashion. The wipeout is being called the biggest bank failure in the U.S. with concerns that it could send shockwaves through the world's economy much like a tidal wave can cause destruction across a coastline. Just as a surfer needs to understand the ocean's currents and waves, banks need to understand how to manage risk. If a surfer takes on waves that are too big or too frequent, they risk being tossed in the water. Similarly, banks that take on too much risk by lending to unreliable borrowers or investing in volatile ventures may find themselves sinking in financial turmoil. In the end, it all comes down to balance. Just as a surfer needs to balance on their board to ride the wave successfully, banks need to balance their risk-taking with a sound understanding of their assets and liabilities. By finding the right balance, they can continue to surf the waves of the industry without wiping out in the end. Let's take a look at the short history of SVB. Back in the early 1980s, a group of super cool entrepreneurs had this awesome idea to create a bank that would exclusively support innovative technology and life science companies. They believed that these industries had the potential to change the world and with the right kind of support, they could unleash their full power. And just like that, Silicon Valley Bank was born in 1983. These rapid pioneers set out to establish a new kind of bank, one that was solely dedicated to helping cutting edge startups and companies that had been rejected by the traditional financial industry. They started by providing financing, banking services, and investment management to these rock star innovators, building deep relationships with their clients and helping them overcome any challenges. As their reputation grew, so did their global footprint. To attract clients, the bank utilized these funds to invest in long-term treasury and mortgage bonds with consistently high returns, and it worked. The bank saw tremendous growth in deposits over the past few years, with deposits doubling from $49 billion to $102 billion between 2018 and the end of 2020. By 2022, the bank's deposit base had further expanded to reach $189.2 billion. Talk about success, right? Now let's dive into some important questions. What went wrong with Silicon Valley Bank? How did it all fall apart? And what does this mean for the future of banking in America? We've got all the details, so stick around to find out. First of all, what went wrong? You know how the tech industry has been booming over the last few years, right? Well, one of the banks that has been doing pretty well for itself in this space is Silicon Valley Bank. However, things recently took a turn for the worst, and the bank ended up failing. So what happened? Here's the deal. 
All of Silicon Valley Bank's customers were commercial customers who had placed large deposits with the bank. At first, this might seem like a good thing for the bank, right? After all, large deposits mean a lot of money for the bank. However, there was a catch. These customers were covered by deposit insurance, which meant that if the bank were to fail, these customers would be protected and would not lose their deposits. In other words, their money was safe, no matter what happened. Now, on the surface, this might seem like a good thing, but it actually put pressure on the bank's bottom line, especially during a downturn in the economy. With rising interest rates and a volatile economic climate, banks like Silicon Valley Bank started to struggle to keep up. Unfortunately, interest rates went up and the value of all the assets that Silicon Valley Bank had bought fell sharply. When people realized that the bank might be insolvent, all of its customers had a real incentive to run and pull their assets from the bank as quickly as they could. And since SVB had around 90% of its accounts with more than 250,000 in deposits, a majority of its deposits were not insured by the government. According to experts, SVB's structure resembled something you'd see in the 1920s or 1870s with lots of local customers and deposits. And in 2020, during the pandemic, those deposits skyrocketed. But things took a turn when the bank invested those extra billions in long-term treasury bonds only to have the Federal Reserve raise interest rates and hurt the value of those bonds. And with the tech sector struggling, depositors started taking their money out, leading to a run on the bank. Ultimately, SVB had to sell parts of its bond holdings at a loss of $1.8 billion. And sadly, the federal regulators took control of the bank within a week. What's next for depositors and investors, you might think? With Silicon Valley Bank's downfall, depositors and investors may be wondering what their next steps should be. Firstly, for depositors who had less than $250,000 in deposits, their funds were insured by the government and they will likely be able to recover their money through the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. However, for those with deposits exceeding $250,000, only a portion of their funds may be insured. In such cases, it is important to reach out to the bank and find out what options are available to them. As for investors, those who held SVB stock will likely see significant losses in the value of their investment. In such cases, investors may want to seek advice from a financial advisor on whether to sell their holdings or to hold onto them in hopes of eventual recovery. It's worth noting that there may be legal action taken by investors against the bank or its executives, depending on the circumstances surrounding the bank's downfall. In such cases, investors may want to seek legal advice on their options. Moving forward, it's important for depositors and investors to carefully consider their options and make informed decisions. It's also a reminder of the importance of diversifying investments and not relying too heavily on one institution or stock. Additionally, President Biden has pledged that the money used to safeguard depositors will come from the bank fees rather than tax dollars. The regulators' actions have ensured the safety and security of depositors' funds despite the unfortunate result for investors. By taking this action, the government is making it abundantly obvious that banks are responsible for covering the cost of their own risk-taking practices. But this is not the end of the problem. The same week after the Silicon Valley Bank failed, authorities closed another bank, Signature, a commercial bank with assets of $110 billion. Several states, including California, Connecticut, Nevada, New York, and North Carolina, had offices for this bank. Customers who were concerned about SVB withdrew their money, which is why this occurred. Prior to March 9th, Signature also had a strong financial position, but its failure shows how rapidly banking customers can panic and move their assets to more secure banks. Many people are perplexed by Silicon Valley Bank's demise and the management and leadership choices made by the bank. According to SVB Insiders, bank CEO Greg Becker made a costly error by openly acknowledging the bank's financial difficulties before securing the required support, which led to a $42 billion withdrawal frenzy from alarmed customers. The bank now has a negative cash position of about $958 million as a result of this action. Becker's leadership and decision-making have come under fire from those who questioned his ability to collect money privately. Many people are left wondering what could have been done to avoid it, despite the fact that he has apologized to the staff and clients. It is obvious that the internal management failures as well as exterior economic pressures contributed to Silicon Valley Bank's demise. The complete scope of the aftermath became clear as the dust settled following Silicon Valley Bank's failure. The Federal Reserve recently disclosed data showing that small banks in the United States have been especially hard hit. After SVB's demise, they saw a record-breaking decline in savings. The total amount of deposits decreased by $119 billion in the week concluding March 15th, 
falling to $5.46 trillion. This marks the largest decline as a percentage of total deposits since 2007 and is more than twice as much as the previous record drop. These figures show how vulnerable the banking sector is and how the failure of one bank could have a cascading impact.